Welcome, Birima Sharma. Many thanks for joining us today um, for a conversation on co-creation and collaboration between industry and academia. Um, before we talk about the specifics of the topic, could you let us know what your background is and how you got involved with this topic? Sure. Thank you, Norma, for giving me this chance to come share about myself and my work on co-creation. I think what you're doing with this conference is amazingly exciting, so I'm very fortunate to be a part of it. Um, in terms of my background, I'm an assistant professor. Um, I teach strategy at University of New Mexico, but my research is on sustainability, social and environmental issues, as well as how businesses and researchers come together to generate knowledge. So very much about co-creation, you know. I've delved in that topic for the last couple of years. It really started with, um, I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Ivy Business School in Canada. So there is a center called Network for Business Sustainability, which brings researchers and managers together to generate knowledge. So I was part of that center, so I sort of stumbled upon this idea of co-creation and just completely was awed by the potential available in the process. So um, I took part in the process. I managed quite a few co-creation projects as well as uh, with my co-author, uh, Tima Bansal, a co-researcher, we studied the co-creation process. So we also have some, you know, taking a step back as an observer and thinking about how do researchers and managers come together to create knowledge? Within the academic community, we're frequently discussing what we can do to make our work more relevant and more intelligible um, to businesses, especially when it comes to issues around responsibility and sustainability. Um, what do you feel is needed um, for um, academia and industry um, to come together more often and uh, co-create knowledge successfully? There are many issues on which we can co-create knowledge, but there is none better than, you know, these really big, wicked problems like climate change or the refugee crisis or any such things facing businesses um, and all of us rather in today's world. So we do need multiple people from multiple sectors at the table to go create knowledge. And, you know, in many ways, um, from what I can understand, this is not something that our academic institutions incentivize. It's a very personal calling, you know, and in fact, it is a trade-off that many researchers make to choose into uh, this kind of knowledge generation process. So, you know, in many ways, it is, it is challenging to say that, okay, I'm going to take a harder path which might take me longer to publish my work and which might not be rewarded by my academic institutions, but I think it's important and I'm going to choose and do this higher, harder path. What is, uh, what is co-creation actually to your, uh, to your understanding? What are the defining um, aspects of, of true and successful co-creation? For me, co-creation is really when um, academics and managers or for that matter, partners from any two sectors, different sectors come together on a topic of common interest. So, you know, we talked about sustainability issues or social issues. They come together, both parties think that the topic is valuable. We need to generate knowledge around it. And then they roll up their sleeves and there are e they, both of them are equal knowledge partners in generating knowledge or solving that problem, you know. And often, uh, especially from an academic's perspective, people often ask, how is that different from consulting? You know, so I think it is different from consulting in many various ways, not that consulting is, you know, um, is equally valuable, but from, from where I am coming from an academic perspective, it is different because as researchers, we bring specific kind of skills and uh, methods to the table. There is an objectivity where our interest is only in generating knowledge for the larger sake. 
So there is a unique value that researchers bring to the table. And also for managers, at least in my experience across many projects that I have seen, it's not, they may be driven by an organization specific problem, but they're not looking to find concrete answers to that problem in that project. The interest is in generating knowledge for the business community. In your experience, what are the different types of knowledge and the different types of logics that businesses and researchers can bring into such co-creation processes? They really bring different kinds of knowledge systems to the process, you know. So by knowledge system, I mean, how do I even generate knowledge? What is my process of generating knowledge? So for researchers, they are interested in a phenomena. They cut a very tiny, thin slice of that phenomena, well-defined, and then they go deeper. Sometimes for years, they're studying the same question and issue, and they have the, um, that kind of time to go deeper, to think about it, to get feedback from their peers, to go back into the field, think about it some more. And as you know, sometimes our papers take years to get published, and it, it is fine. You know, It is knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, in contrast, managers are looking for, uh, look at breadth, not really depth uh, for tiny slides. They're bombarded with many questions, many issues, many challenges in everyday work. They're looking to solve those. They're looking for solutions to problems. And as compared to a researcher's work, which is generally mostly an individual work of thinking and writing, I think for managers, this kind of knowledge generation and problem solving is team sport. You know, they have lots of people working with them, lots of uh, minds together with the objective that we have to um, achieve, solve this problem and achieve the performance we seek to achieve in a limited amount of time. What gets uh, me very interested in your unique perspective on the issue um, is a recent publication of, of yours and uh, Tima Banzer, where you're um, saying, well, co-creation is actually not something that happens exclusively at a specific co-creation event, but it happens over a longer period of time between partners from research and industry. Um, what exactly um, is your is your thinking behind that, and how did you how did you arrive at that perspective on co-creation? So most of the prior work uh, that has been published and written about when we think about knowledge co-creation between researchers and managers, they focused on what you're describing as events or meetings or workshops, and we just discussed about the differences in knowledge systems. So if you look at this. A small, uh, one particular instance of time, and you think about the big mountain that both parties have to climb to talk to each other, to hear each other, and actually to generate knowledge together, it's not surprising that most of the work points to the challenges of uh, how hard it is for um, researchers and managers to come together. Um, at the same time, everyone points toward the potential. So we were drawing from this prior work. So we um, studied two co-creation projects over a period of two years. And in these co-creation projects, managers and researchers would come together, solve uh, our work on a particular um, issue in the knowledge creation process. So let's say creating frameworks based on data. They will go back into their respective worlds and then come back again and then go back. So they would have these monthly meetings. For them, the challenges they faced in these individual meetings were really just small hiccups in part in sort of going to the final price. So for them, the entire project was this one long moment where, you know, Coming together and facing smaller hiccups was just part of the process. And they were looking at what is to come at the end and looking at it with a lot of excitement and a lot of energy. And if you, if you look at uh, literature or research in general, the term that uh, researchers often use for this kind of uh, phenomena is called process ontology, which means that we are not looking for linear movement from point A to point B. You think about the world in flux, the world in movement, you know, so these little hiccups are only a part of the longer flux and movement. And they, so our participants were adopting this process ontology and saying that to them, co-creation is 
process, even when we poked them or probed them about telling us about specific moments. So as researchers, that was an aha for us. And we sort of said, maybe we need to rethink how we understand co-creation and how all, the, all of us have understood co-creation and what has been printed before. And think about, you know, it is not what happens in these moments. It is about a process over time. And, you know, by adopting this process ontology, sort of the chances of success of co-creation to us, you know, are higher. Do we need a framework for these kind of long-term co-creation processes? Um, do we have the tools and the skills to facilitate these kind of things over longer times? The closest, I think, that I have often seen used in research is Engaged Scholarship by Andy Vandervan. Um, and he has, his framework speaks to the researchers because he's drawn a lot on philosophy of science to present that framework. So um, I think it's good to have structure. You know, it's good to have structure. But it also it is also good to check our assumptions in using those frameworks and using those structures. So for example, in my reading, and we say that in the paper, the engaged scholarship framework does not really dissipate the um, the knowledge hierarchy between researchers and managers, you know. So if we think about society in general, I think researchers are seen as sort of harbinger of knowledge creation, while managers are seen as you know, their work is to implement the knowledge. So, so in my reading, that framework sustains that hierarchy. So even though managers come in to share their perspective, they're not really um, changing in the sense of um, creating together. So I guess the larger point that I'm trying to make here is that it's good to have structure around our interactions because everyone's time is limited, but also we must check our assumptions when we use that structure in terms of are the underlying assumptions such as knowledge hierarchy working for us. What have you observed in terms of uh, the role of relationships if we're talking uh, about these longer terms, co-creation processes that you've observed? I think where for me relationships really come into the picture is what I said a few minutes ago about the knowledge hierarchy. So there's definitely sort of a power dynamic often between researchers and managers when they come together. Um, in most cases, researchers are seen as experts, you know, when we, especially when you think about research you know, conducting a research. So my, uh, they are seen as expert, it's their responsibility, we're along for the ride and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think diffusing those dynamics to me is critically important in making these co-creation works. So from that perspective, I think relationships are important because they have an underlying power dynamic to them and we need to figure out ways in which that dynamic can be generative for the process. Uh, the typical um, stepping stones um, that you have to cover if you want to um, be successful uh, in longer term co-creation processes or are there specific stumbling blocks that uh, seem to come up several times or again and again? We need to carefully think about the space and the process we design in order to uh, make this work. So in our the, the projects that we studied, you know, there was this movement of back and forth. So you come together, you would, uh, you know, create knowledge together, but then you can have an opportunity to go back into your sort of comfort zone and, you know, really bring on your skills and flex your muscles and really go deep and really figure out if this is working or not, and then bring that, that back again. So this back and forth over a limited period of time, was really, uh, you know, a, a factor in my mind for these uh, projects to work. Um, the other thing I think is, again, going back to this issue of power dynamics, when they come together, when both parties come together, um, there are two dynamics that I can see going on. One is that researchers find it hard to sort of share some of the knowledge uh, creating authority, for lack of a better word, um, with the managers, you know. So for them, you know, they're sort of reporting back, right? So they've created, the, conducted this data, they've thought about what to make of it, they've done their work, and they're coming into this meeting and they're going to report back. 
and their objective is to get a tick mark from managers saying that oh great you know this is keep going you know and uh, so or sort of complicating the dynamic it's managers thinking uh, you know, I'm just going to let them do their stuff and uh, the researchers do what they do best. And then I'm going to parachute in at the end of the project and I'm going to translate everything they've done into easier language so that my peers can use it. And to me, that sort of leaves a lot of value on the table, you know. So how would you diffuse those dynamics is a key question for success, you know. So how can you tell managers, no, it's not just saying yes or no. If you say no, you have to change the uh, what's not working. And for researchers to say, be okay with that change and say, even though my data might uh, take me in certain direction, this set of managers who are going to use my framework are telling me to take a slight detour, you know. So both parties have to be okay with that. A little provocative question. Who is harder to convince to engage in these kind of collaborative settings, researchers or industry? I'm always conscious of the time and trade-offs it takes to, um, and not only that, I think there's also an image and identity involved around um, engaging in this way with practice, you know, so being seen as sort of less of a researcher if you engage with a, a practitioner equally, not just studying them, but studying with them, you know. What do you feel are the benefits um, to people actually engaging um, with each other, learning each other's languages and uh, trying to solve problems together. I do think that uh, research for re research sake is important, but it's also important to have impact on practice, you know. So if you care about that, if you as a researcher you care about impact of your work, there's no better way to um, bake an impact than engaging in co-creation work. So it is highly satisfying to see your work being used, your work being understood, your work being you know, disseminated. So that is very satisfying uh, feeling. Mm, and also maybe learning a little bit of the language of the business, you know, so I can see it helping me in my classroom when I speak with future managers, you know, I can speak in their language because I've had sort of experience and learning of, uh, you know, uh, how do I take these big ideas and translate them into accessible language. So I definitely see in my world that a benefit of when I engage in co-creation projects. Um, I think for managers, I'm speculating, but I think for managers, um, you know, I'm hoping they get some answers to their questions, you know, uh, that are keeping them up at night around collaborating with different sectors, around embedding uh, sustainability in their culture and what can they really do. And, you know, a lot of them also love this reflection time. They're so busy in their day-to-day -day work that taking an hour out every month and getting together with researchers and really just reflecting and thinking about their organizational experience is often a very sort of valued space for them, you know, uh, to do that. Um, and a lot of them in some of the co-creation projects we study sort of see themselves as change agents in the sense that they want to take the work or the output that they have co-created with researchers and present that to their peers and present that in industry association and industry conferences. And so in that sense, it's also a benefit for the larger community where you're taking this rigorous research and your peer is sort of telling you, hey, here's how you can implement it. If you're thinking about, about the future and um, the future of uh, sustainable innovation and co-creation, what do you think? Where will we be in 2030? There are contexts in which co-creation might not be the best solution and there are boundary mm -hmm. conditions to that. And I think climate change science is one telling example of that, that, you know, um, we, they cannot, there is no um, leeway for anyone to question the science. And often when we think about co-creation, people get many opportunities to question rigor, but we have no time left to question science around climate change, right? So there are certain cases in which the scientist or the researcher has to take back the expertise and say that this is the solution. All we can talk about is how to implement it. We cannot open sort of or question the science underlying the solution. The larger question, even more important than co-creation is research impact, 
you know. Um, so co-creation is just sort of a tool to get there, you know. Um, but we need to think about how our research impacts practice. And, uh, and there are other ways, and we have to remember those other ways, and those ways are valuable too, where, you know, you in, invest your energy into translating your research or speaking in public forums or engaging in a dialogue around the data, the results that you've already accumulated on your own as a researcher. So, you know, translation and transmission is as valuable as, uh, you know, co-creation. So I think what we need to ask ourselves is the broader question of impact and not just co-creation. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>